Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first session in our series, Tracking Vegetation Phenology with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and um, I will be joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez for this series. For this training, we will have three one-hour sessions on June 30th today, July 7th, and July 14th. All of the materials for the training can be found at the course website shown here. This includes recordings, the PowerPoint presentation, and the one final homework assignment that we'll have available at the end of this course. This is an introductory course, so the only prerequisite is the fundamentals of remote sensing. At the end of this session and for all the sessions, we will have a question and answer portion. And if we don't get to your question during that time, you can also email me um, or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses shown here. As I just mentioned, we will have one follow on homework assignment. That homework will be submitted uh, via Google Forms. Um, and if you attend all three live sessions and complete the homework by Thursday, July 28th, so that'll be two weeks after the last session, you um, will receive a certificate of completion. And these will come about two to three months after the completion of the course. Um, so do please uh, be patient with us as we get all the certificates out to um, our global audience that we have here. So for this course, we will have three parts, um, and this is the, the general outline. First, we're going to start with a really um, basic overview of remote sensing um, and phenology. Um, then in, the, in sessions two and three, we'll talk about different scales of phenology and national networks. And then um, we'll talk about some examples of multiscalar analyses um, that have been done using remote sensing and uh, ground-based observations for phenology. By the end of this session, you will be able to identify how remote sensing can be used to study phenology. Recall the satellites and sensors that can be used to estimate land surface parameters. Identify various NASA products for phenology and um, learn how to access remote sensing data via a couple different portals and web tools. So starting off with what is phenology? Phenology is the science of the seasons such as blooms, buds, migration, and emergence. Phenology describes how organisms are specifically adapted to the environmental cycles that surround them and applies to nearly all aspects of life on Earth, including abundance, distribution, and diversity of organisms, ecosystem services, food webs, and the global cycles of water and carbon. This is really the study of the timing of reoccurring plant and animal life cycle stages, or phenophases, and their relationships to environmental conditions. The timing of phenological events, such as leaf bud burst or first flower, can be quite sensitive to environmental conditions. For example, in a particularly warm and dry spring, these phenophases might occur weeks earlier than usual. Whereas in an exceptionally cool and wet spring, they may be delayed by an equal amount of time. As a result, the timing of phenophases tends to vary among years based on patterns of weather, climate, and resource availability. Phenology is one of the oldest branches of environmental science, dating back thousands of years. It originates from the Greek word pheno, to show and bring to light. Many cultures have traditional phenological proverbs and teachings that center around future weather and climate and the effects on plants and animals. Peak cherry blossoms throughout many parts of the world were one of the first documented phenological events. Some of the first long-term studies on phenology were collected by Swedish botanist and a British landowner who kept systematic records of bud burst and flowering. 
So as I mentioned, phenology is the study of the pulse of our planet and is essential and it is an essential and critical component of environmental science influencing biodiversity, species interactions, and their ecological functioning. Also, it affects fluxes in water, energy, and biogeochemical elements at various scales. Changes in phenology depict an integrated response to environmental change and provide valuable information for, for global change research, as well as things like land degradation, pest and invasive species management, drought monitoring, wildfire risk assessment, and agricultural production. These ecologically important processes are also sensitive to climate change. We are seeing um, earlier springs and later falls in much of the world. However, not all species are changing at the same rate or direction which can lead to questions about how species are responding to seasonal and environmental long-term change. In some systems, like in the temperate regions of the United States, there are lots of long-term data with clear relationships. So in this image here, you can see changes in first bloom date with oranges indicating earlier blooms and blues indicating later blooms for lilac and honeysuckle. Leaf bloom events are generally happening earlier throughout the north and west, but later in much of the south. This observation is generally consistent with regional differences in temperature change. Other studies have looked at trends in leaf and bloom dates across all of North America and the entire northern hemisphere. These studies have found a trend toward earlier spring events with some more pronounced trends um, that you can see here in the um, contiguous U.S. While we can monitor these phenophases like bud burst, there are drivers of these patterns within our Earth system, such as temperature, where we can see spring coming earlier, summer lasting longer, and generally higher temperatures over much of the U.S. The image on the left shows the rate of temperature change from 1970 to 2014 where you can see red colors indicating increasing temperatures. The time series on the right indicates annual average temperatures in the US from 1901 to 2016, where you can see that temperature anomalies are al almost always positive from about the 1980s onward. Another important driver is water availability. However, it's less clear how the long-term trends in the timing and abundance of precipitation impacts phenology. As, warm, as a warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor, there um, is more potential for larger rainstorms. And that's consistent with the fact that heavy downpours have been on the rise in um, nearly every region in the lower 48 since the late 1950s. Average pre precipitation during meteorological spring hasn't changed much, actually, since the, since the 1970s. The lower 48 has have seen um, a bit less overall precipitation with a change of 0 0.03 inches less per decade. Um, so that's not um, really a significant trend. Regional patterns, however, tell a different story. In the southeast, the decline in precipitation has been as much as half an inch per decade. By contrast, there's been more rain in the Pacific Northwest, especially in the western portions of Washington and Oregon, where some climate divisions have seen increases as much as 0.33 inches per decade. There are many real world applications of phen phenology studies. For example, um, earlier flowering for many people might mean earlier allergies. Farmers and gardeners need to know the schedule of plants and insects development to decide when to apply fertilizers and pesticides and when to plant to avoid frosts. I've mentioned how phenology influences the abundance and distribution of organisms and in turn, how phenology may be altered by changes in temperature and precipitation. 
how plants and animals respond can help us predict whether their populations will grow or shrink, making phenology a leading indicator of climate change impacts. This will include applications of phenology like invasive species, predictions of human health related events, such as allergies, which I mentioned, and the mosquito season. Optimization of when to plant, fertilize, and harvest crops. Understanding the timing of ecosystem processes like carbon cycling. And assessment of the vulnerability of species, populations, and ecological communities to ongoing climate change. Remote sensing plays an important role in observing the seasonal patterns of variation in vegetated land surfaces. And this is considered land surface phenology. So this is really what we're going to focus on for today and throughout much of this course. While the observed patterns are certainly related to biological phenomena, land surface phenology is distinct from traditional definitions of vegetation phenology, which refer to the specific life cycle events that I mentioned, like bud break, flowering, or leaf senescence. Um, and those really use the in situ, in situ observations of individual plants or species. Although the meaning of land surface phenology in many ecosystems is clear, there are also environments in, wi in which the relationship is more complicated. And this is seen in places like mixed forest, evergreen forest, and drylands, where phenophase shifts might not be as distinct in satellite imagery. However, satellite rem remote sensing data are widely applicable to studying regional and global patterns. With a moderate spatial resolution, these satellites provide, some of them provide global daily measurements of land surface properties, and therefore are well suited for monitoring the seasonal patterns and trends due to regional and global phenological variation and change. So now that we've provided an overview of phenology and land surface phenology, let's jump in to review um, some of the satellites and sensors that can be used for phenology. So this might be a bit of a review for some of you, but it's important to outline um, what can be used. Landsat is probably the most popular satellite, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it before. It was first launched in the early 1970s, and most recently Landsat 8 was launched in um, 2013. So we have this continuous data at fairly high resolution of 30 meters, um, which is really useful for examining land surface change over time. All of these data are also freely available by the USGS, um, and Landsat provides data every 16 days. And with two currently in orbit, it's possible to obtain an image every eight days. There are some differences between the bands of the various Landsats, which is shown here in the figure on the bottom right. So this is something to be aware of as you use Landsat imagery um, across time from different sensors. MODIS is one of the key imaging instruments for our NASA Earth observing system. And it's really used a lot in phenology. It's designed to measure large scale global dynamics across lands, oceans, and the atmosphere. The MODIS sensor flies on board two satellites that um, capture imagery of the same area on Earth at different times per day. The two instruments are almost identical. Um, They're called, uh, uh, the two satellites are Terra, Terra and Aqua. <clears throat> and it really uh, allows us to provide this global, multispectral, and multi-temporal data <clears throat> of Earth to build a comprehensive record of our Earth's parameters. The Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS, is very similar to MODIS, with a few extra and updated aspects. These data are available from 2012 to present with a slightly improved spatial, spatial resolution for one of the channels at 375 meters 
And there's also a 750 meter um, channel and product. <clears throat> Veer's data can be used for similar mapping of vegetation changes and thermal anomalies. So it's really useful for mapping things like fires as well as um, regularly occurring changes um, across the earth. VIRS was created to act as a transition from the MODIS sensor, which has been in orbit for quite a while, <clears throat> over 20 years actually. While MODIS and VIRS can be used to examine similar features on the Earth, there are some notable differences which are outlined here. First, the spatial resolution is improved with VIRS um, from 500 to 1,000 meters with MODIS to 375 and 750 meters with VIRS. Um, this is illustrated in the image on the top right shown here with MODIS on the left and VIRS on the right. Additionally, the spectral coverage is slightly different. So you don't get data as far into the mid-infrared bands with VIRS, but that's generally not an issue for vegetation monitoring. There are also fewer bands um, from 36 with MODIS to 22 for VIRS. Um, VIRS also flies at a slightly higher orbit, so you definitely get global coverage each day. However, you still have the issue of clouds because it is an optical sensor. Um, and both MODIS and VIRS have comparable uh, radiometric and spectral quality. So this allows us to create a long time series of data using both of these data sets together. So you can create something like the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, shown here on the bottom right, um, from both of these sensors and do this over many, many years. The Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, or ABHRR, can also be used for phonology. It's operated by NOAA, and there are multiple instruments on board the POSE satellites. The very high resolution is uh, a bit of a misnomer because the spatial resolution is actually fairly coarse at um, one kilometer. The very high resolution refers to its temporal resolution um, with the uh, global revisit time uh, twice a day, in the morning and afternoon. ABHRR has um, six spectral bands, which includes near-infrared, mid-infrared, and thermal bands. So this uh, sensor is really the backbone for um, the creation of the global land cover product um, provided by NOAA, which can differentiate between different types of grass, shrubs, cropland, and water. I also wanted to mention the Sea Viewing Wide Field of View Sensor, or CWIFS. Um, this took measurements of chlorophyll from 1998 to 2010 for its ocean products, it can also be used to derive land products such as uh, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. CWIFS collected global data at four kilometers spatial resolution, and it also collected targeted data um, at a higher resolution at one kilometer. EcoStress is a really unique and new sensor that stands for Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station. It's primarily designed to study evapotranspiration, which is one of the most basic processes of living plants. You can also obtain evaporative stress index as one of the products. Because it's on board the International Space Station, it only takes measurements in specific locations so the data are not available globally like many of the other satellites. <clears throat> the data coverage is centered around 12 key climate zones across the globe that are um, in conjunction with FluxNet sites that measure um, meteorological and um, uh, vegetation parameters. The spatial resolution is coarse at 400 kilometers, but data are available many times per day and hourly at some locations. This highlights the trade-offs with different types of resolutions as we focus, as we discussed, um, as we discussed in our Fundamentals of Remote Sensing course. The data for EcoStress are also available on many different 
portals, and we'll discuss some of those later. I also wanted to mention another mission that's currently in development called the Surface Biology and Geology Mission, or SBG. It's in the development phase at NASA, but it will be focused on providing hyperspectral and thermal data, which will not only provide information about phenology generally, but with a hyperspectral sensor, you'll be able to identify different species of plants. And um, there are other applications for this too, like water cycle, um, anthropogenic impacts, carbon fluxes, um, volcanoes, and landscape changes. Right now, um, you as the end user community can get involved in the um, creation of the sensor and um, provide feedback on the types of applications that you could use these data for. Um, and you can sign up to get um, email updates at these um, addresses shown here. The European Space Agency, or ESA, also has a suite of satellites that can be used for phenology. I've outlined two here, um, Sentinel-2 and the Spot constellation. Sentinel-2 is similar to Landsat with an improved spatial resolution of 10 to 20 meters for the visible and near-infrared bands. It also has a, a more frequent revisit time of about five days, so it takes an image of the same place on Earth about every five days. There's a lot of work currently being conducted to harmonize Sentinel-2 and Landsat. Um, and you can click on the link here to get more information about that. So that would allow us to um, provide more frequent imagery of the same place on Earth using the um, various overpass times of Sentinel-2 and Landsat. Many spot satellites, which were created by the French Space Agency. And uh, most commonly, uh, spot six and seven are used. Um, they have visible and near infrared um, bands and have a um, high resolution of about six meters and a pretty frequent vi revisit time. NVSAT's medium resolution imaging spectrometer, or MARIS, acquires multispectral imagery of the Earth. MARIS is a programmable medium spectral resolution sensor with 15 spectral bands. Although data from MARIS is primarily used for the measurement of ocean color, so sort of like sea whiffs, which I mentioned earlier, um, it can be used to monitor the state and evolution, evolution of Earth's vegetation color as well. In particular, the MARIS Global Vegetation Index um, corresponds to the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, or FPAR, that we'll talk about later. Um, this is a uh, standard product from MARIS, and um, this really allows folks to um, understand the critical role of plant photosynthetic processes um, through uh, primary productivity of the vegetation canopies. And we'll discuss a lot of this later as well. So that was a brief overview of the satellites and sensors you can use for phenology. But now let's go on to discuss some of the land surface parameters we can obtain from those data. Here I have listed both vegetation indices and biophysical parameters that can be measured and quantified with the satellites and sensors that we discussed. The vegetation indices are generally calculated as a ratio of the reflectance values from different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, along with some of the biophysical characteristics. Other parameters require ground-based data in conjunction with remote sensing data to generate things like land cover maps. We'll discuss each of these parameters in more detail in the next few slides. So you all have probably heard of the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, and it's really the most widely used land surface parameter for monitoring phenological shifts. As an overview of how it's calculated, when sunlight strikes plant leaves, the chlorophyll in these leaves strongly absorbs visible light in the blue and red, and the cell structure of the leaves reflect green 
and really strongly reflects near infrared light. This is portrayed in the graphic here um, on the left. So the two key wavelengths for NDVI are the red and near infrared. In the graph, you can see where the red is being absorbed in low reflectance, and the near infrared is being highly reflected. Using mathematical formulas or algorithms, scientists can transform the raw satellite data about these waves into vegetation indices. So this is um, an index of greenness or the relative density of health of vegetation for each image or pixel um, of the satellite image. So NDVI is this relationship between the red and the near infrared wavelengths. And the actual formula is shown here. Values of NDVI for an individual pixel range from negative one to one. Any pixel between negative one to zero means there's no vegetation and pixels close to one indicate the highest poss possible density of green leaves. The picture on the right shows that healthy green vegetation absorbs most of the visible light and reflects the um, near infrared, as I mentioned. Unhealthy or sparse or senescing vegetation reflects more visible light and less near infrared light. Um, and then you can see the resulting uh, difference in the NDVI values um, below the two um, images of the trees. So plant phenology is the annual dynamic of vegetation greenness and can be tracked through these vegetation indices. In the graph on the top, you can see the progression of vegetation dynamics as the season change changes. In North America, early in the year, which is winter, um, there are little to no leaves on the trees resulting in low NDVI values. When spring arrives, the vegetation greens up and NDVI increases until it peaks in the summer. Then as vegetation senesces and loses its leaves, NDVI declines. The image below shows the difference in greenness in the winter versus the summer in North America. So by transforming the raw satellite data into NDVI values, um, these products provide a rough measure of vegetation type, amount, and condition on land surfaces across the world. And NDVI is really useful for this global scale um, dynamic monitoring. NDVI values can also be averaged over time to establish normal growing conditions in a region uh, for, a or for a particular time of year. Further analysis can then characterize the health of the vegetation in that place relative to no the normal. When analyzed through time, this can reveal where vegetation is thriving and where it's under stress, as well as changes in vegetation to human activities, such as deforestation, natural disturbances, such as wildfires, or changes in the plant's phenological stage. NDVI anomalies are often used to show current vegetation patterns relative to long-term averages. This can be calculated by subtracting the long-term mean from the current value and is often done on a monthly basis. So if the anomaly is negative, this indicates that vegetation is less green than normal, which may be indicative of drought, like you can see in this progression of images along the bottom here. There are other indices such as the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, that can be useful. EVI is another measure of vegetation health, and it's particularly useful in regions with high biomass because the NDVI can oversaturate or hit a maximum in regions like the Amazon. Whereas EVI has a higher threshold and can identify more subtle differences in these regions using these various parameters. The soil vegetation index, or SAV, minimizes the influence of bare or nearly bare ground when trying to assess vegetation. 
This one could be used in semi-arid or arid regions like the southwestern U.S., where there is a greater percentage of bare ground or soil cover relative to the vegetation. The Normalized Difference Moisture Index, or NDMI, uses the shortwave infrared band, which is more sensitive to water within vegetation. Thus, it can detect subtle changes in vegetation moisture and is a good index to evaluate things like drought. The fraction of photosynthetically active radiation, or FPAR, quantifies the fraction of the solar radiation absorbed by live leaves for photosynthesis. Therefore, it refers only to the green and alive elements of the canopy. This depends on canopy structure, vegetation element optical properties, atmospheric conditions, and the angular configuration of the satellite. PAR is the spectral range from 400 to 700 nanometers that's used by plants in photosynthesis. The fraction of PAR is a parameter used in remote sensing and in ecosystem modeling that signifies the portion of this, um, these wavelengths used by plants. So FPAR is commonly used in ecosystem models because it has an important influence on exchanges of energy, water vapor, and carbon dioxide between the surface of the earth and atmosphere. Precipitation and temperature are two of the major factors that determine the proportion of PAR absorbed by plants. This is also an important um, measure in biomass production because vegetation development is related to the rate at which radiant energy is absorbed by vegetation. It can be measured on the ground or over large areas with satellites. Fractional cover refers to estimating the proportion of an area that is covered by each member of a predefined set of vegetation or land cover types. For mapping fractional cover, the proportions of the different classes should sum to one. In terms of remote sensing, the area being considered is generally a pixel, and the estimation of fractional covered is considered a type of, um, a type of spectral unmixing which this gets a little more complicated and we won't really cover much of this in um, this introductory webinar, but what, what fractional cover provides essentially are insights of dry vegetation and bare soil, as well as mapping the living vegetation. For example, by monitoring the proportion of living vegetation and bare ground through time, land managers can determine which parts of their property show heavier or are underutilized. Placing water points in placing additional water in maybe ungrazed areas may help livestock come to these regions. Fractional cover estimation requires that a land cover map is created ahead of time. Accordingly, the output of fractional cover estimation is an estimate of that proportion, so the percentage of each percentage of total of each class for each pixel. One limitation of fractional cover estimates is that for all of the classes which cover proportions are estimated, it, it must be defined prior to the analysis so that creating a land cover map ahead of time may be the limiting factor in using something like fractional color because you're going to need some ground-based information and an accuracy assessment to conduct that land cover map. Um, we have many other um, trainings provided on land cover mapping, time series analysis, um, and accuracy assessment um, through the RSET land management um, application area. So do please check back on the website if you're interested in these types of things. Leaf area index, or LAI, is a dimensionless variable and a ratio of leaf area to per to per unit ground surface area. This ratio can be related to gas vegetation exchange processes such as photosynthesis, evaporation and transpiration, rainfall interception, and carbon flux. So this is a key biophysical variable 
that influences land surface photosynthesis, energy balance, and transpiration, and is closely related to net primary productivity of terrestrial ecosystems. Since green leaves play a critical role in controlling many physical and biological processes of plant canopies, LAI being the key structural characteristic of vegetation is also widely used as an indication of vegetation status. Thus, accurately estimating and mapping LAI at regional, national, and global scales is really crucial. Primary production is the rate of organic biomass growth or accumulation by plants. Primary production is commonly split into two components, gross primary productivity and net primary productivity, so GPP and NPP. GPP is the overall rate of biomass production by producers, whereas NPP is the remaining fraction of biomass produced after accounting for energy loss due to cellular respiration and maintenance of plant tissue. So NPP equals GPP minus respiration. So this is an important component of the global carbon budget and is also used as an indicator of ecosystem function. So now let's discuss um, some of the specifics of each of these products that are really readily available from satellites. Um, and, and these align with the vegetation indices and those biophysical parameters we just discussed. Standard NDVI and EVI products are available from MODIS data and are generated every 16 days at 250 meter spatial resolution. The algorithm chooses the best available pixel from all the acquisitions within a 16 day period. So this helps um, eliminate uh, pixels that are covered by clouds um, and identifies the highest NDVR EVI value. The collection names are listed here and the data are available at these various um, portals, which we'll discuss in um, the, the final section of this lecture. VIRS has vegetation indices, such as the NDVI, EVI, and a newer EVI2 algorithm. Um, here, again, the best pixel is selected over a 16-day acquisition period, and this is available um, at various spatial resolutions, with the, um, um, the highest being 500 meters. As mentioned, the EVI is slightly um, from NDVI as it's more sensitive to canopy cover. Additionally, the EVI2 is similar to EVI, but it only uses the red and near infrared bands. So it doesn't have those additional um, uh, components or uh, standard values associated with the equation of EVI2. So the advantage of this is. Um, that it can be calculated with um, sensors that don't have the blue band, which is included in the EVI calculation as well. The MODIS LAI and FPAR products are available at four and eight day composites, a resolution of 500 meters. As with vegetation indices, the algorithm chooses the best pixel, pixel within that four eight day window. Um, as we discussed, LAI is an index that quantifies the one-sided leaf area of a canopy, where FPAR is the fraction of incoming solar energy absorbed through photosynthesis at 400 to 700 nanometers. VIRS also has an LAI FPAR data product, which provides information about the veg vegetation canopy at 500 meters. Again, these products are intentionally designed to align with the MODIS products. The MODIS Gross Primary Productivity, or GPP product, is a cumulative eight-day composite of values at 500 meters, and it's based on the radiation use efficiency concept we just reviewed. It can be used as an input to data models to calculate terrestrial energy, carbon, water cycle processes, and bio, 
geochemistry of vegetation. The data product includes information about GPP and net photosynthesis. This um, composite image over the continental US was acquired during a period between March 26th to April 10th of 2000. And this shows regions where plants were more or less productive, for example, um, where they inhaled carbon dioxide and then used the carbon for photosynthesis to build new plant structure. So you can see there are higher rates of GPP in regions like the Appalachians and the Sierra and Cascades. For the NPP product, the core science of the algorithm is an application of the described radiation conversion efficiency concept to predictions of daily GPP. And this uses the satellite-derived FPAR product in ind independent estimates of PAR and other surface meteorological fields. So this is a sort of a modeled product available. Um, and as we discussed, the estimation of respiration is subtracted from GPP to arrive at this annual NPP product. So this isn't necessarily going to be useful in monitoring phenophase shifts because it, it is an annual product, but we, it could be used to show how ecosystems might be changing from year to year um, as a result of the, the, the NPP. VIRS also has a land surface phenomenon or LSP product um, that is newer and it's really exciting and it ties to a lot of the other data systems that we're going to discuss next week. So the VIRS global LSP product provides consistent spatial and temporal estimates of the timing and magnitude of phenological development of the vegetated land surface across the globe. So it's really suitable for characterizing and understanding interannual to decadal scale changes in ecosystem response to a changing environment. Um, it's provided at a spatial resolution of 500 meters and is produced using an algorithm that was refined from the MODIS collection. Within this product, you can obtain 12 phenological metrics along with um, some quality assurance metrics. Um, things um, like the six phenophase transition dates that are closely comparable to things like phenocam, which we're going to talk about more in depth next week. These images illustrate the validation of the VIRS global land surface phenology products. On the y-axis are the Landsat pixels, and on the x-axis are the VIRS pixels. And these have been identified as displaying different phenology attributes, such as greenup onset, senescence onset, and many others. Validation of these products are also based on in situ data, such as um, leaf phenology, which we'll discuss in the next lecture. The primary takeaway here is that Landsat at a 30 meter resolution and VIRS at a 500 meter resolution can be used to detect these changes in land surfaces over large regions. So as I mentioned previously, Landsat can also be used for monitoring LSP. It's important to note that the data are only available every 16 days at 30 meter spatial resolution. So more detailed features can be observed on the ground when compared to things like VIRS, but the repeat time um, is a limitation because you may miss important transitions in plant growth or senescence. The Making Earth System Data Records for Use in Research Environments or Measures program focuses on creating products that can be applied to the research community. And this is oftentimes really on the cutting edge of science applications. Um, they have been working on two products that are relevant to the, the phenology community. Um, that I wanted to discuss here. So the first of these products is the Vegetation Continuous Fields, or VCF, which provides global fractional vegetation cover at 0 0.05 degrees, which is about five kilometers spatial resolution, at yearly intervals from 1982 to 2016. 
fractional vegetation cover is the ratio of the area of the vertical projection of green vegetation above the ground to the total area. So essentially this is looking at the density and distribution of vegetation. This is the primary means for measuring global forest change and is a, um, is a parameter that's included in um, products like the uh, Global Forest Watch, which is produced by um, Matt Hansen and his group. The Vegetation Index and Phenology global data sets were created using AVHRR and MODIS data. Um, this product was developed to provide consistent measurements of NDVI and EVI2 over 30 years, and it's produced in collaboration with the University of Arizona. Additionally, climate data are really important when conducting um, more detailed analyses and modeling of phenological events. Many temperature and precipitation products and some of these are included, um, some of these we'll discuss next week, but I won't go in depth to the climate and precipitation data. Um, however, I've included a few links here, and um, there's also more information about these types of um, satellite products through our water resources RSET webinars. So do please take a look at those if you're interested. I also wanted to note that while I didn't go into this in much detail, ESA also has a wide variety of similar products. So these include things like NDVI, FPAR, LAI, et cetera. And they are available from a few of the satellites I mentioned, like Sentinel-2. Um, you can access these data through um, ESA's Copernicus Global Land Surfaces um, portal shown here. Okay, so in the final portion of our session, I just wanted to really briefly highlight some of the portals and web tools that you can use to access and analyze these um, data products that we've been talking about today. The WorldView tool provides the capability to interactively browse over 900 global full resolution satellite imagery layers and then download the underlying data. It's a really beautiful interface and is designed to display sort of how the Earth looks right now in, in near real time. Um, this is a great place to find MODIS and VIRS data in quick order. NASA Earth Data Search is a map-based interface where a user can search for different data layers and filter results based on spatial and temporal constraints. Um, the nice thing about Earth Data Search is that you can also um, customize your data prior to download. So you can reformat, reproject, and do some spatial subsetting of your data and then download them. Um, there, there, this is also a link to some of the various NASA DACs, um, the Distributed Active Archive Centers. And the primary one for land surface mo monitoring is the Land Processes DAC or LP DAC and um, it houses many of these products that we've talked about. One tool within the LPDAC is, um, is called Appears, and it's a really great data subsetter which provides access and um, value exploration for a variety of data. Um, it's really a simple and efficient way to perform um, some analysis on your data prior to downloading it. So you can do um, spatial subsets, um, you can um, create some time series, um, you can look at data over um, specific pixels or over specific areas, and interact with the data through visualizations and summary statistics. Google Earth Engine has, also has some incredible functionality. And you can access many of the NASA data sets through their collections and conduct analysis, like calculating vegetation indices, doing land cover classification, change detection, et cetera. Um, here's a screenshot of what the code editor looks like for those of you who may be familiar. Um, and you can write scripts in um, Java or Python. It's free to sign up and use. Um, and we've also included 
Google Earth Engine and some of our past trainings with our set, in particular, our training on time series analysis, um, where we use the land trender um, algorithm within um, GEE. So do please take a look at that if you're interested in more info. Climate Engine harnesses the power of Google Earth Engine through a map and gra graphical interface that looks like this. It also has a variety of the data sets that we discussed today, like NDVI from Landsat and MODIS. Um, so you could create a map um, like this shown here. And this is a median NDVI from the last year in a mixed forest and agricultural region in Brazil. The great thing about Climate Engine as well is you can evaluate statistics and select different time periods you can also create a polygon and um, create a time series all within the tool and analyze your, your data there. Um, you can also download data as a CSV or a GeoTIFF for a particular area of interest. So this is all to say there are many networks and data portals for um, accessing the satellite data as well as um, the airborne and near surface and in situ um, remote sensing data. Um, and we're gonna be talking a, a lot about these networks next week, such as the National Phenology Network, the National Ecological Observatory Network or NEON, Phenocam and many more. So we're really going to connect these satellite products with the ground-based data um, next week. So in summary for today, we provided an overview of phenology, in particular land surface phenology. We discussed various vegetation indices and biophysical parameters for monitoring phenophases, um, and then talked a little bit about the various data products and the access points for how you can visualize and download these data. So we're gonna get to some question and answers. Um, but if we don't get to your questions today, you can follow up with myself um, or my colleague, Juan Torres Perez, at our email address is shown here. If you have general questions about RSET, you can contact our um, program manager, Anna Prados. And again, you can visit the RSET website for all of the past trainings, as well as this, the information on this training that I mentioned. Next week, we, as I mentioned, are going to discuss these scales of phenology and national networks. So do please join us again on July 7th. So thank you again for being with us today. We're going to have some time for um, question and answer. And um, what we're going to do is transition over to our um, Q&A documents. And we will also post the questions and answers that we provide today to our training website after the course is complete. So you can come back and, and check on those questions as well. So thank you so much. And um, please do give us a moment as we transition over to our question and answer portion. All right, everyone. Um, so just bear with us. We're going to transition over to the document for today. We do have about seven minutes to the top of the hour. However, um, we may go through some, uh, some more questions. I've seen quite a few coming through. Um, so we'll get to as many as we can um, today. And then also do please check back um, for um, your um, answers to some of these questions that we may not have gotten to in the live portion, we will uh, try to address those um, after this session and provide those to you all as well. Um, great, so we will just go ahead and get started here. Um, as these have come through, we've been able to um, try to answer some of them along the way, so we can be uh, quick to get through some of them in the live portion. Um, so hopefully you can all see the question and answer session document here. And the first question, question one is, are there public databases of site specific and variety specific crop phenology? Um, and the answer is yes. And we will cover these extensively in session two. So we're going to talk about um, particularly 
networks for the U.S. where they are large-scale ground-based networks of um, ground-based monitoring for different types of species. Um, and some of these do include um, crop phenology. Um, we will also cover um, some we will also cover other systems like um, the PhenoCam network, um, which is a near surface remote sensing network that um, takes measurements and images of um, regions. And I believe some of those also include crops. So that's all to say, stay tuned for next week. We will cover that in depth. Okay, question two. Can we analyze phenology in India using remote sensing? And what are the sensors covering Indian region? Um, the answer to that is yes. We, as we mentioned throughout this today's session, we covered many satellites and sensors that are global. Um, these include MODIS, VIRS, AVHRR, Landsat, Sentinel-2, et cetera. And uh, all of those for NASA are freely available, as we mentioned. I provided some of the examples to the portals where you can also access these. Um, I think this question came in a little early on before we got to some of those. So um, do reference the slides for all of those that we mentioned that are global. Okay, question three. Can we do it via SAR data? If yes, then how? Um, and SAR data can be used for vegetation monitoring. Um, it, we covered this extensively in a recent RSET training. Um, so we're, we're only focused on optical data for this training, um, but we did discuss the ability of the use of SAR data, particularly for forest monitoring um, and looking at time series and change of forests. So do please uh, go to this link here to um, get all the information on that training. Um, we provided some hands-on exercises where we used Google Earth Engine to monitor um, forest um, with that training. So we won't cover it here, but do please check. And, and there are also many other um, SAR trainings available on the RSET website, um, more introductory level um, overviews of SAR data. I'm not the SAR expert, so we have someone else who, who does those for us. Okay, question four. Um, I believe it refers, yeah, okay. How to use eco-stress evapotranspiration for phenology? Can it be used for India? Um, and eco-stress is, is one of those unique sensors that is on board the International Space Station. It's a very new sensor as well. and so we don't obtain those global measurements like we do with MODIS or VIRS, but I do believe that EcoStress takes measurements over some agricultural regions in India, and in Northern India in particular. Um, and I've included the link here to where you can view a map of where all the EcoStress measurements can be seen. So do please um, take a look at that. Uh, you also can download the data from EcoStress via LPDAC, which is something I mentioned today. But we also had an RSET Lightning webinar all about the EcoStress sensor, which was a one hour um, training where we talked about the data locations and how to access it. So I've included the link to that training. Um, as well. So do please take a look at that if you're interested in eco stress. Okay, question five. What are the value ranges for EVI? Um, so as we mentioned, um, EVI is an index, just like NDVI. Um, the values should range between negative one and one. So um, anything below zero is going to be no vegetation. Um, values closer to one are um, really green, healthy vegetation. You may uh, end up getting values outside of the, um, the range of negative one to one if you have done any sort of like overcorrection for atmospheric effects. Sometimes you'll get some wonky numbers 
um, but they should be within that same ratio like you would see um, in DVI of negative one to one. Okay. So the next question six, are spot images freely available for non-Europeans? And I had to look this one up because I'm not familiar, very familiar with spot myself, I've not used it, but I believe they are freely available to anyone. But it looks like on the ESA website, you have to um, be approved to access those data. So I've included a couple links that I just uh, Google searched there. Um, so do please take a look at that um, and, and um, to get more information about the, the spot images. Okay, the next question seven. Can we monitor a profusely flowering tree through its spectral, spectral signature? And can intensity of flowering be monitored? So as we've discussed in this session, um, the indices like EVI, NDVI, et cetera, are really used to monitor vegetation vigor. And they are available at differing spatial resolutions, but they're all, um, coarse enough to where you're not going to be able to identify a specific tree and the flowering on that specific tree, right? So um, if you have ground-based information on leafing and flowering, then you could compare that information to the remotely sensed indices. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit in the next session, but really in session three. Um, but you do have to really be careful in, in thinking about the limitations of satellite data for these types of things. Um, so the indices here are really um, measuring greenness and that vigor of greenness. So you may not necessarily be able to uh, tie that directly to an intensely flowering tree, but maybe you could tie that to a leafing tree um, that is in a large stand that covers a, a, a large region and is pretty homogeneous. Um, so I think that question really gets at some of these limitations and the trade-offs that we have to consider when using um, satellite remote sensing data. Okay, question eight. Um, there are some multiple questions about NDVI data here, and I also think this came in a little early on before we went through a lot of these specific details. The first is what's the temporal resolution, temporal coverage. Um, mo MODIS data are available daily. You do have to consider um, cloud clouds when, um, especially in places like tropical regions that are often cloud covered, um, you know, that is the limitation of optical data, um, but they are daily. I believe the MODIS data are in version six. Um, they are they are avail available for both Terra and Aqua. And there is a combined product that pulls the best pixel from both of those sensors. Um, so you'll see those differences in the MOD, MYD, and I'm forgetting offhand what the others is, what the other um, sort of acronym used for those are. But yes, they are available for, for both. Um, I've referenced where you can download the data through the slides um, that the Land Processes DAC, Distributed Active Archive Center, or the LPDAC. Um, you can also access them via Worldview, Earth Data Search, et cetera. So do please reference those slides for those, those questions. Okay, question nine. Um, should the parameters used at calculating SAVI and EVI vary depending on attributes such as vegetation type? So the values provided in the presentation today are pretty standard uh, for SAVI and EVI. And so um, I do recommend starting with those and they don't often change according to vegetation type. Um, you may change the correction factor of, um, say, the SAVI um, value, I think, is 0. 0.5. Um, and SAVI, as, as I mentioned, is really useful for areas that have um, less dense vegetation and um, can be more influenced by uh, surrounding bare ground. 
Um, so you could maybe play with that a little bit depending on your area, but I do recommend just starting with these constant um, values for those coefficients. And, and also, as I mentioned, EVI is, is really useful in um, regions of dense biomass. So if you have a really dense forest, EVI is often used as opposed to NDVI. Question 10 is really interesting, and I hadn't thought about this before. Um, but the question is, what is the difference between NDMI and NDWI? They're both constructed using NIR and SWIR. And um, yes, I've seen both. So I've actually seen these used interchangeably in the literature. However, um, there is a version of NDWI that uses uh, the green and near infrared wavelengths. So I've, I've seen NDWI referred to as the near infrared and the SWIR bands similar to NDMI, um, but I've also seen it referred to as the green and near infrared. So that is a little confusing. Um, however, generally NDMI is used to determine vegetation water content and NDWI is uh, really used to analyze water bodies like lakes um, by using the green uh, band there. So it is a little confusing in the literature. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but there is also this distinction here that I've outlined. Okay, question 11. Is there any training for SIF studies? And I'm not sure what this question is referring to. So could if you could um, spell out what SIF refers to, um, that would be helpful. Maybe I'm, I'm just missing that there. Okay, um, question 12, why is LAI used? So LAI is the leaf area index. So if you were able to monitor changes in the leaf area, um, this sort of this percentage of cover of leaves in a particular region, you could monitor that throughout the season to evaluate how um, the green up or um, leafing is occurring in certain um, um, ecosystems. So again, as we'll mention, as we'll talk about later on in the series too, um, looking at these patterns and these shifts in um, both the, the vegetation indices and some of these more biophysical parameters throughout the year, is really going to be useful in identifying um, these phenophases and these shifts um, as they change with seasonality. Okay, question 13. Why do we absorb very high values in EVI? What does that mean? So as we outlined, EVI has, has a, a few correction factors and that's really, um, that really applies to the index to help deal with this oversaturation. So sometimes with NDVI, we can reach a value of very close to one. Um, and then even in regions where the biomass may be more dense, NDVI is gonna sort of like max out at a particular value um, in these regions. So EVI in the use of these correction factors can really identify a more subtle um, increases in um, density of veg vegetation or vegetation vigor in these heavily forested regions like the Amazon, for example. And so um, it is recommended to use EVI in, in these regions. And, and, you know, NDVI has been around a really long time. EVI is a little newer on the scene, although it has been around for a while too. Um, so folks even use EVI in regions that are not um, as dense as the Amazon, um, but, but that's the real difference there between those two. Okay, question, question 14. Um, 
I want to see if the dust a mine produces affects the surrounding vegetation. Um, in the literature review I've done, the most used index is NDVI. I've also seen some reference to FPAR. Uh, would you consider analyzing the evolution of FPAR? Would it be convenient to use some other index? Um, I've never looked at dust mine um, and the effects on um, vegetation, but I would say that, um, yes, NDVI is the most common. It's been around for a really long time. Um, but I would also consider these other indices as well as the biophysical uh, metrics like FPAR. Um, and the uh, FPAR products are, are pretty convenient because the FPAR has already been calculated for you. Um, so I would recommend comparing these. Um, and as with all of these remote sensing studies, ground-based information is really, really valuable. Um, so I would consider that in the study. Um, and if you have ground-based information, you can then compare your, what you're seeing is truth on the ground to these various indices to evaluate the usefulness of one index or um, one product over another. Um, so, so I would consider doing some kind of comparative analysis of these if, if this is what you're interested in studying. I'm sorry, I'm not a super familiar with, um, with that study area. Okay. How is EVI different? Oh, so this is question 15. How is EVI different than NDVI? And then what features are better shown with EVI2? So we mentioned this earlier, uh, EVI is really useful in the um, areas where you have high density um, biomass, um, forested regions. Um, and we will talk about EVI2 a little bit in the final session. Um, EVI2 is a, a newer index um, that, that really goes off of the uh, EVI, EVI um, measurement itself. Um, but the great thing about um, EVI2, and I'm just going to pull up um, my comparisons here. But the great thing about um, EVI2 is that it um, uses the, um, it also just uses the near infrared and red as opposed to using the blue band, which is used in the, the normal EVI calculation. So if you, for example, maybe don't have a blue band available with your, with your imagery, EVI2 is useful and um, can also be analogous to the values that we see with the standard EVI index and useful for high density biomass regions. Okay, um, maybe I will answer a couple more here. We'll go to maybe about 15 minutes past the hour. And I do notice there are many other questions um, and so what we will do is uh, I'll look at a couple more and then um, what we'll do is actually uh, take a look at these questions and answer them on the document and provide the answers to these at a later date on the course website. Um, so if, if your answer has been um, noted and put in this document, then we'll take a look at it and, um, and try to answer those. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll go for a couple more. Um, question 16, which indices should be used for crop stage identification? That's a great question. Um, NDVI, again, is, is a very common index used for, for crops. Um, I know it's, it's sort of the basic um, index that we've talked about, but um, it can be used to identify crop um, growth as well as it's, it's a really great marker for um, identifying when um, harvesting has occurred. So you, you'll be able to identify this really sharp drop in NDVI when 
the the crop is harvested. Um, NDVI is also used many times in conjunction with evapotranspiration values um, to identify uh, the vigor of crops and also to help with um, looking at the potential of evapotranspiration as well as the actual evapotranspiration to help with watering of crops and to um, help with water conservation. Um, for example, if your uh, actual evapotranspiration is very close to the potential, which is like the maximum, um, you may not need to water as much. Um, so those, those two are used in conjunction a lot. Um, but NDVI really is a, a commonly used one for crops. For crops. Okay, question 17. In which circumstances do we use NDVI, SAVI, and the triangulated vegetation index? I'm not familiar with the triangulated vegetation index, um, but as we've, as we've discussed, NDVI um, and SAVI, so NDVI is sort of your, your go-to, um, but SAVI is really useful in areas where there is um, less dense vegetation and more influence of the bare ground. So the savvy has that correction factor um, to deal with um, the brightness oftentimes of the surrounding soil that may be affecting your um, vegetation health uh, values. So I would say if you have a very sparsely uh, vegetated region, uh, maybe use SAVI as opposed to NDVI. And um, I'll have to look up the triangulated vegetation index. I've not used that one in, in the past. Okay, um, is it possible to measure soil quality? That's a really good question and some is something that we won't cover here. Um, the Satellites are really just observing the surface layer reflection, the, the, um, the wavelengths that are being reflected and absorbed by whatever it is on the ground, um, given optical sensors. So you really can't measure soil quality um, necessarily unless you're getting ground-based information of uh, and taking soil measurements. In, for some of the networks that we will discuss next week, we'll talk about the NEON network, which is a, um, a series of basically towers that collect a variety of um, data. And I believe that some of those are actually taking soil measurements and analyzing uh, soil quality, but that's really difficult to do with um, remote sensing. Okay, um, the next question, what is OpenDAP? I am not familiar with OpenDAP. That's something I'll have to, to take a look at um, and, and get back to you on that one. <laughs> okay, the next question um, is an LAI direct product available um, for any of these, yes. Um, so, an, there there is a LAI product available from Veers and from Modus, and we outlined those um, towards the end of the session. So, um, I believe that the um, Modus. LAI product is available as a four day and eight day composite. So you can get either of those where the best pixel within four days, for example, is selected um, to generate those products. Um, and I believe that the Veers data just has the eight day composite. And uh, those are uh, most readily available via the LP DAC. And we did we discuss those as well. 
and I believe that's the only, um, those are the only um, LAI products that are, that are identified. Okay, um, next question, 21. Is MODIS NPP calculated from spectral properties? Can it be calculated with Landsat? Um, so the NPP is an algorithm that uses the, it's essentially um, using um, the reflectivity of the um, radiation from the MODIS product. And I don't, you know, this is something I'll have to look into exactly how the NPP is calculated. Um, NPP is only available annually and it is a function of the GPP. So it's essentially the estimation of respiration that is um, subtracted from the GPP to arrive at the annual NPP product. Um, and I, I'm not familiar with exactly how the algorithm is calculated. Um, so it is available annually from MODIS, but I'm not sure if you could also um, calculate that yourself um, from Landsat. I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay, so the next question, how can I apply the phenology evaluation in dry forest monitoring? So I don't believe there would be any difference in um, applying phenology in dry forest, in a dry forest versus a, a more wet ecosystem. Um, it's really just going to depend on um, the evolution of the greenness of the vegetation. So if, it, if you are evaluating a system that is has more pines, for example, that may not lose their leaves throughout the season, you wouldn't really necessarily be able to identify these phenological shifts from the remote sensing. So um, the, the satellite, the optical satellite observations are really just measuring that um, reflectivity of um, essentially the, the near infrared. And so if you're in an ecosystem that has consistently green leaves throughout the year, or um, I'm thinking of like a pine, pine forest type situation, you might not be able to identify these shifts. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at with that question, but um, you could also take a look at patterns of um, precipitation, like we mentioned earlier, and compare those to um, variations throughout many years um, in leaf leafing or green up events um, in different types of ecosystems. For example, if you had a, a very a particularly dry year, um, you might not see the, the green up happening as early in the year, for example. So you could compare um, these these products and these indices of um, vegetation vigor alongside climate variables to identify differences in the seasonality and the shifts throughout uh, multiple years. Um, so that, that might be useful for you as well. Okay, maybe we'll do one more. <laughs> And then we'll stop for the day and then we'll get to some of these um, questions later on. Um, the next question, 23, when, when using the various data products for research, do we need to perform georeferencing prior to data analysis? I always recommend having ground-based data to help validate the remote sensing products. In any sort of um, large-scale research, you're going to want some kind of ground truthing. 
um, to really ensure what you're what you're looking at on the ground or what the satellite is telling you is ref reflective of the um, patterns you're observing on the ground. Um, you don't necessarily need to um, align the remote sensing data or do any kind of um, post-processing to make sure that it, um, it's lining up with your ground-based data, but I would um, encourage um, ground-based information to um, be used in conjunction with remote sensing data because there are the limitations that we've discussed um, and we will talk extensively about these ground-based and near-surface monitoring efforts particularly in the U.S. because that's where we've seen these large-scale efforts um, and so the use of those data in conjunction with the remote sensing data can really provide you with that holistic picture of um, the ecosystem changes and, and what's really really happening. Um, okay, well I know there are, are other questions, but we're almost half an hour over time for today. So we will get to your questions eventually um, and, and fill these out and, and put them on our website after the completion of this course. So do please come back and check those then. Um, and I wanna thank you all again for being with us today um, for the first session. Please come back for sessions two and three. Next week, uh, we're gonna talk about these um, large scale um, monitoring networks, primarily across the US. Um, so do please uh, come back with us next week um, for, for that. So thank you all and, and have a nice day.